Okay, uh, so my name is Marcus Perryman. I've worked for Microsoft for some time now, about 20 years, um, in lots of different areas, mostly around coding. Um, but right now I work in the Windows team and I work in a group that's part of the Windows team called the PAX team. And our responsibility is to look at the glue between Microsoft operating systems, Windows specifically, and our partners and our customers and about trying to um, increase and uh, improve the partner ecosystem. So one of the areas we've been looking at for some years now is um, the ARM technologies that are available uh, for Windows. And uh, I mean, you might think uh, when you think about ARM uh, versus Intel, you, you may cast, if you, if you go back that far, I know certainly Pete does, um, CISC versus RISC was a, was a big conversation that happened around the 80s, probably before that even, uh, when we were sort of debating whether um, a CISC chip, a, a complex instruction set chip, uh, was the right way to go versus a reduced instruction set uh, chip, uh, which was better. There, there were definitely advantages of each of those. And it was a conversation that went on for some time. And it seemed with the um, rise of Intel and Windows and the direction that we went there, that actually CISC seemed to win out. But that problem is, or the, the, the learnings from that, uh, that time have never really stopped. And the, the challenge and the questions around that continue. And in fact, uh, are still happening today. We're still discussing which is the right or the advantageous chipset architecture. Because when we go back to uh, the 1980s, ARM or Acorn Risk Machines uh, invested very heavily in risk. And that was their uh, their mindset for low power, um, high capable, highly capable devices, but with minimum uh, uh, instruction set, so you do lots of things very quickly, um, and they uh, they majored in this this whole thing about low power uh, computing. But what we find today that uh, through the generations of these chips and advancements of technology and reduction in in die size, uh, low power doesn't actually mean low power. Um, so you might be using less watts, but the chips of today are actually very capable and very fast uh, at uh, delivering experiences for consumers. Now, now, don't get me wrong, they're not the top chips. You, if you're looking at uh, a workhorse desktop machine or a server machine, then there are still advantages and there's still more powerful chips that you can get uh, with the CISC instruction sets. However, that balance is definitely shifting. And, you know, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of those things as we as we go through. Uh, in fact, well, let's, let's hit on one or two now. System on chip is uh, something which has been around again for a long time. But we hear about it more and more these days, about the capability of pressing multiple um, dedicated pieces of hardware into the same piece of silicon. Uh, and it's a technique that was used to be very expensive. You, you'd uh, ask for somebody to create one of these system on chips, maybe if you were doing an embedded controller for traffic lights or for um, uh, some sort of uh, uh, harsh environment system where you wanted something which was robust, very small, uh, low power um, and low maintenance. But these days system on chips is actually a standard way of delivering uh, computers that we buy from retail outlets uh, today. And actually the, the capability of building these system on chips is, uh, is increasing uh, through, uh, through each generation and, and adding versatility and power in the die that goes into the into the chips. And what we get when we think about the learnings of uh, ARM and the direction they're going with physically smaller silicon. And so and what I mean by physically smaller is from the same piece of, you know, sort of round um, slice of silicon, they can get a significantly larger number of, of, uh, of actual chips out of that silicon cheaper because the fact that components are low, uh, comp component counts are still lower, uh, quite a lot lower than uh, than a CISC machine. Uh, and so therefore they're less complex and they have higher yields in general. Uh, and also because the power is lower, it means that the machines they build that, that or the, the components that are needed to keep those machines going are lighter. Uh, and so you can actually have more utility built into those machines or they run for longer. So, so the, the, all those questions that we uh, looked at back in the 1980s are still going 
uh, and they're still here today. And actually, uh, what we find is with the a limit of power in a single core or the slowdown in the increase in power in a single core. Parallel processing means multiple cores uh, placed in the same silicon um, and in a situation where you've got a lower uh, die size actually um, the, the risk architecture provides or, or uh, promises um, a much wider range of possibilities in multi-core solutions uh, on a single chip. So, so it's quite an interesting question today, but when Windows picks this up, the big question we get is, well, is this another Windows RT? Uh, if you can remember back, and I can't actually remember when it was released, about 2010, something like that. Uh, we did actually, we've had a several goes at shipping devices on different silicon. And there are, there are reasons why we try to do that. There's some good things about um, having diverse silicon within our machines. It allows innovation, it drives price point, it drives lots of good behavior in, in having that. But Windows RT, many people remember as yeah, not being quite so successful. We did actually have Windows 8, uh, 8.1 it was, that was running uh, on an ARM chip and we shipped a, uh, a device at the time called a Windows RT device or a Surface RT device. Uh, we didn't sell a huge number of them and the problem we had at the time, people felt that the compatibility in the software um, or the lack of compatibility in the software was a problem because people weren't willing to engage in building uh, apps for the device uh, and people wouldn't buy the device unless people engaged in building apps. And so the challenge was, how do you keep that ecosystem going um, uh, to, to, to bring the volume and to drive the, uh, the demand for new apps? So have we got another Windows RT when we're looking at Windows on ARM today? Well, the answer is no, not really, because right now we've got a, a bit of a perfect storm uh, coming together. So those things I spoke, spoke about uh, in terms of the, the risk versus CISC. Part of the factors that are driving that today, you think about the market uh, and the places where you find CPUs or chips. The large majority of chips these days are in uh, smartphones or smaller devices, and they are already running the ARM chipset or, or chips based upon the ARM instruction set. Now that drives volume. And when you've got volume, you drive price down. So the smartphone market has been um, significantly beneficial to the landscape of CPUs for the desktop market because it's driven innovation, it's driven price point, and it's actually got to a point where it's really quite interesting uh, to keep going with that. The second thing, I, I, I suppose, as a result of that is the innovation that we're seeing with, with manufacturers like Qualcomm. Uh, the ARM V8A was their first 64-bit core chip. Um, sorry, the ARM V8A gives us a 64-bit instruction set, and Qualcomm have maximized on that to give uh, to, to deliver very powerful, very high, high-powered chips um, for driving things far beyond smartphones, uh, the capability of a desktop. And then that system on chip that I talked about, well, actually, people are starting to bring not just a single core uh, ARM chip, 64-bit, uh, but actually multiple cores. And actually, they're not symmetrical. They're looking at asymmetric patterns where you have uh, a number of maybe higher power, more capable cores uh, that drive the interactive experience of the user. And then a, 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 a maybe a larger number of smaller, lower power cores that sit on the same chip that drive background execution or long-term execution at a lower power rating. So actually being able to mix and match these cores in the same die uh, provides some very interesting scenarios in the chip. Now, as well as that, having dedicated chips, you've already seen with things like graphics. Uh, what, what about if we bring in sort of 5G or 4G onto the same chip um, and, and reduce all this size down to a single, uh, single system on chip? You've got everything in a single package, reducing um, or increasing reliability, reducing power uh, and, uh, and making the computer significantly lighter uh, and smaller for us to carry around. So, so we're right there at this point where, and in fact, consumers are demanding smaller devices to bridge the gap between their phones, which are too small, and their laptops or desktops, which may be still considered a little on the large side. So what is it they can fit in the middle, which is light, always on, gives them everything they want, 
uh, and it's portable. And that's where the Windows on ARM um, proposition sits. So, so let's think about I'll answer the RT question in a little bit more detail later in the presentation uh, around the compatibility. But let's stay on the chip just for a moment. So to give you an idea of where we are with performance, uh, these numbers and these slides come from Qualcomm. So you take them with a pinch of salt, look behind them and, and do your own investigation. But it, it does give you a good picture of where we are with performance uh, on the chip. So uh, just as a graphical comparison, two bars showing that at peak performance or peak throughput for a 15 watt chip uh, versus the new 8CX chip that Qualcomm shipped last, uh, last year, they're about comparable in terms of throughput. So they can both deliver the same capability uh, at a 15 watt level. When the um, wattage for the uh, desktop chip is reduced, to seven watts, the HCX continues to deliver at the same rate. And that puts it about two times the throughput of the 15 watt, uh, the original 15 watt solution for the chip. So, if, you know, if when you're actually looking at uh, ultimate throughput, yes, they're comparable. When you're looking at power per instruction or power per uh, MIPS, the Qualcomm chip comes out pretty well against that. So we're actually seeing significant steps forward in this chip technology. Um, and, and well, one of the things actually that's interesting about this, the, the Qualcomm chip is also now running on seven nanometer um, uh, chip dies, which are, is fantastically small and uh, leading the market there. Uh, so this this is the system on chip I was thinking talking about. So again, slide from from Qualcomm, and they're uh, they're talking about what can be possible, uh, and the numbers they're providing here. They're saying that you know with the same chip, at the, at the same power, we can see not just a CPU running uh, on this same die, but if you add to that uh, a signal processor for the maybe for GPU, uh, maybe you add an accelerator for um, for doing uh, um, machine learning and then you can add into that the uh, Wi-Fi or the radio side of that into the same die uh, and other things all on the same chip you actually end up with a very performant and very exciting uh, technology group sitting on that um, on that die. So, so let's come back to the RT question if we're just producing another Windows RT where there are no apps for this yeah, isn't it going to go the same way? Well, we've Microsoft have been doing uh, a lot of work since Windows RT to find a way to bridge that gap, to give a solution that is uh, enables this, the ecosystem to kickstart, to get going and uh, get the volumes of devices out there with experiences that people want and then get those experiences improved. So what we shipped in 2017, I think it was, was the ability to emulate on an ARM device, the uh, x86 instruction set. What, what does that mean? Well, when we come to an ARM device and run uh, an x86 PE format executable, the Windows operating system will, will make use of what we created many years ago called the WOW or the Windows on Windows abstraction layer. And it will uh, put into that Windows on Windows abstraction layer the indirection and the the required to allow the x86 instructions to be decoded into ARM instructions and execute the application on that device. So it's taking an x86 uh, application, it's loading it with x86 instruction set in that in those code pages, it's not recompiling it, and it's effectively interpreting as it goes through instruction for instruction onto that machine. Now, that's great because it means that uh, a huge number of apps that are out there today, that are historic apps, continue to execute on the platform. And it means that the gap between what users expect and what is available is relatively small. It's still there and I'll explain why uh, later. It's still there, but it's, uh, it's much smaller and users are willing to actually jump in to this environment and uh, start using it. But there are downsides to this. It does give us a leg up, but it also means that the um, uh, x86 to ARM emulation is expensive uh, on memory and on power. And so we don't quite get 
well, if everything's running in this emulated mode, we don't get that that uh, the realization of that uh, dream of all day or multi day battery life. But, so so we'll come again. We'll come on to that a little later. Let's think about while we're here, how does it actually work? Well, if you take an x86 application and run it on an ARM machine, the same loaders go ahead. The, the, the kernel is compiled to ARM native. The drivers are compiled to ARM native. The system DLLs are compiled to ARM native. But what happens in the process is the abstraction layer will um, run the uh, the code pages from that application and interpret them and then call into the native system DLLs. Now there are, in order for this to work, you need to have these hybrid DLLs sit in that process space. And that's where the hard work was done in creating these hybrid DLLs that are part x86 and part ARM64. So they, they can link as an x86 DLL and load into that process space. But when you execute inside of that, they're actually running ARM64 code. And those are the bridge that, that give us um, the, a, a significant performance step up uh, when running these uh, uh, these x86 applications. So that's the stack that we get today uh, on ARM64 machines. We have the ability to run the majority uh, of x86 applications. <clears throat> So what does that give us? Well, what's the promise that Microsoft uh, is saying by bringing these things together? So we bring the the, the power of the ARM chip, the, uh, the, the sorry the capability of the ARM chip, the low power of the ARM chip, the uh, long battery life, the system on chip capabilities, and the execution of x86 applications. What do we get? Well. The, the vision that Microsoft has is that ARM64, Windows 10 on ARM64 devices, will be as close to the desktop experience as is possible. We are, we're obviously aiming for 100% to give exactly the same experience. It, it gives you true multitasking. It, it works like a Windows machine. It gives you tablet mode, Cortana, pen, ink, um, Win32 apps will run, UWP apps will run, and all the peripherals where we own the driver set for will run as well. Um, taking their system on chip capabilities, the chips we're shipping are all LTE capable. And that starts to change the discussion around mobile computing. So when you pick up your laptop, it's not a case of, oh, maybe I need to hotspot my phone. The laptop itself is that connectivity built in. Um, and it starts to drive a different market around purchasing and connecting these devices um, going forward, changing the landscape about what a connected device actually is. Now, bringing Windows power into this space means that people or users can expect a different experience from Windows. I mean, we expect our smartphone, you press the power button, bang, there it is. Well, when we've got this capability inside of a Windows machine where it's always on, uh, then we have the same experience. So one power press, one, one key press, and within uh, a second, you're on and the screen's going as if it was never off. Well, because it wasn't, it just has a low power state that it goes into. And so it starts to blur the line between what is a mobile experience, like a, a phone today, uh, and what is a tablet or a tablet or desktop experience uh, of today. And it brings these two things much closer together. And this is the real dream beyond all day battery life. Imagine you actually charged your laptop up once a week um, and then it just worked. And then uh, the weekend you thought, oh, maybe I should plug in. And we're not quite there with phones these days. Uh, you know, they, some, some are, some aren't. Um, and we're not quite there with the, with the devices that are running uh, ARM64 and Windows today. But that is our aspiration is to, is to drive that battery life to a point where it becomes a uh, irregular process of charging things uh, and the target is um, beyond 24 hours uh, of usage for a device active usage not standby uh, and that's that's where we're going for and then the last part of that is always connected so having these devices that when you bring all these things together you end up with us with a, a change a fundamental change to the way um, computing starts to um, proliferate uh, 
yeah go out through the community so everybody's always connected everybody's always on um uh, and everybody's always mobile and, and that's the vision we have for windows 10 on arm so what about the reality what, what have we got in terms of devices well in 2018 uh, there were three devices that shipped you probably didn't even hear about them the um the chip we shipped it on was a 64-bit uh arm-based processor from qualcomm it was relatively low power um, and it was a first dip in the water. These devices did ship in the US. And in fact, I've got, I think I've got one of them here still, one of the uh, Asus devices uh, underneath all the wires. Uh, so they're, they're the yoga device is still a pretty nice device um, that you can, uh, you can do development on and, uh, and make use of ARM64 development. The second wave happened in 2018, 2019. Uh, in fact, that 613 that I showed you is a, is a Wave 2 device that was based on the 850 chip. And that actually took a major step forward in performance. There's about 20% more performance on that chip than on the previous one. But really what we were waiting for was the 8CX, which was the um, uh, it was a huge step forward, about 40% step up in performance. And in that wave, Microsoft released last year, um, the Surface Pro X device, which is uh, a really sweet device. Uh, and, and you may have seen the announcement in October when we talked about this device. Uh, it's, it's pretty quick, uh, comparable, easily comparable to an i5 in terms of uh, performance, incredibly light, uh, it comes with a, a little pen, very nice device to work on, very high, uh, high resolution screen, um, quite a desirable piece of kit. Uh, I thought I'd throw the marketing slide in while I'm here. Uh, so this, I thought this was quite interesting. So what does this mean for you? Well, you're going to need some more popcorn uh, because you can now sit and watch Netflix all day and all night without having to charge. OK, uh, just a bit of fun. Right. So let's actually take a look at the device. Now, to do this, I'm going to flip over to my device, Let's see if this works. Somebody shout at me if it doesn't. I think that should now be showing my own device. Yeah, I can see that. And you'll be looking in my ear as I'm playing around with this machine. So this is a, a Pro X um, machine. And as you see, it's pretty, pretty snappy, pretty responsive. I don't know how well Zoom's gonna show this off, but you can see I've got a command prompt. Um, I've got, I can, I can type bad commands in, I can even type good ones. It's, it's pretty, pretty rapid. It does everything you'd expect. Uh, it's got a Windows system 32 as you'd expect. Um, it, it does updates, same as everything else. It's got a couple of things you maybe haven't seen before, like it's got a program files arm, as well as an x86 uh, and uh, a base one. So you, you've got a few other things in there. Um, it's got a browser and I've actually updated this one to Edge Next uh, and the browser is pretty quick so we can go and load, I don't know, let's go to the Surface site and you can see the snappiness of the browser as we go in here. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty nice. In fact, it will run almost all the apps. So we've got Calc, as you'd expect, built in, Snappy, it's the same, same um, was programmer mode of course it's the same calculator as you get on the desktop or on every other uh, machine um, but it also runs x86 applications as well so what better application to run than, uh, than Visual Studio so I'm going to show you this uh, and I'm, I'm making a point as I do it and the point is very specific uh, but let me be clear this is not intended as a developer, develop on device today. So we develop for these devices, we don't necessarily develop on. But just as a demonstration of the emulation layer, you can see here that uh, I'm actually able to run the full Visual Studio 2019 uh, environment. But it's a bit slow. And it's a bit slow because it is emulated. Uh, so I've just loaded up a project in there. Now, now I can tell that it's emulated, well, partly because it's slow, but there's other ways of doing that. Uh, so if I if I go into Task Manager, um, I'll show you how you can find out. So it's still loading. You can see it's pretty pretty clunky in the background. 
I come over to details here on my task manager uh, and I come down and find DevEnv, you can see, let's actually open that up. Uh, 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 open that file location. I'll just grab that file location and we'll go to it. Okay, can you, is that font okay? I think uh, looking on there, yeah, that's probably okay. So if, I, if I'm in here, if I look for devenv.exe, so there's the process that I'm actually uh, running. It's so, so do I know it's an x86? Well, I can sort of guess that because I can see that it's got x86 in the path, but that's not, not always the best way. I can actually run all of my developer tools on here um, to actually check it out. So if I run a dump bin on it, of course, you know, everybody runs a dump bin whenever they can. I can see how here that the PE, the, the the executable file format actually tells me it, it isn't uh, built for ARM64. It's built specifically um, for x86. So this piece of code is being emulated. I can confirm that by taking a look. But what else? What else have I run in here? Oh, I, I've got edge running. So let's take a look, see what that is. So if I come back to, let's just close that one out. If I come back to my task manager, uh, here's Edge. Oh, that's interesting because Edge is running in the x86 folder as well. Let's take a look. If I open that file location um, and do the same trick. Uh, MS Edge there, if I dump in Smash headers, MS Edge directly. What do we find? Well, actually, it turns out even though this Edge version is installed in the x86 folder, it is optimized for ARM64. So Edge, when you download and run that on the device, is running as a full native ARM64 experience. So, so why is that? Why is that important? Well. If you're looking at taking advantage of, of the performance um, and you have a website, it may be that, that might, that's a quick way uh, to get your application up to the performance spec that you need uh, to run on these devices. So let's, let's just take a look. I've got Spotify installed on this machine twice for a very good reason. So the first one I'm going to run here is the Win32 application that Spotify shipped from their, um, from their website. It's also in the store. I chose this one because it makes it slightly easier to do the comparison, uh, but it's actually the same code. Uh, so I've been talking for what, you know, 15 seconds. It hasn't yet come up. And of course, the embarrassing step is, is looking at all the different things I've been playing um, over the last few weeks. Uh, so there, there it is, but the experience works, right? It's an x86 experience working on here. If I search for something, let's say red hot, there's the chilies and it, and it all sort of works fine on here, but just a bit slow. Uh, what happens though, if I go to the Spotify website, because Spotify have got this player experience that's actually got a web front end to it. Well, it just so happens that Edge allows us to install these experiences. If I go to the dots here, I can install them as a PWA using the apps. And you can see I've already done that. I've got Disney Plus and Spotify installed. And we're working on a technology that we'll uh, talk more about towards the end of the year to allow installation of these as proper PWA apps like this one here. So this is a pinned PWA experience of Spotify. Bang, and it's there. That's the web experience. And the responsiveness of that web experience is significantly better than the Win32 simply by uh, wrapping that as a PWA. So what am I trying to say? It's one way to get great experiences on this device is to consider PWA as a way forward. And PWA Builder, uh, I think we might, there maybe there's a talk on that. If not, we should get one uh, for you guys uh, to take a look at. Um, okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to show you on the actual de device. Let us come back over to my dev box. 
Bum, bum, bum. Stop sharing. Bang. Okay, we'll come out of the slides. And let's kick off Visual Studio because this is a coding session. Okay, so what we're going to do, how do you build an application for um, ARM64? Well, let's go and do that. I'm going to create a project in here. I'm, I'm going to stay with C Sharp uh, and I'm going to stay with UWP. We'll talk about the other frameworks uh, later. Let's stick with that. So here I go. I'm going to create a brand new app called App2. Uh, and we'll create that. Now I can choose, in terms of support, the earliest you can go is 1803. You remember on that slide I showed you that the earliest devices were late um, 2017, early uh, 2018. But 1803 is the earliest build that we support uh, for targeting these, so don't go any earlier than that. Uh, but anything after that is fine. So I'm going I'm to select those. And I am going to wait for it to build. Come on, it's getting there. Great, so now I've got my application. Let's see if my coding skills are up to scratch. And we'll go and do something nice and complicated like a text block. Uh, let's do vertical alignment. Uh, we'll go centered. I don't know how many times you've probably seen this. Somebody typing in centered horizontal and vertical alignment. Let's go for a font size, I don't know, 46. And we're going to say, okay, that's, that's fine. We can run that and we can test it out. But let's put something um, else in here. Let's put a margin so it can be really, don't tell my design team, because they'll take me out and shoot me for doing this, but uh, 0, 100, 0, 0. Just put it underneath. Uh, we'll give it a name this time. And we'll call it CPU name. I'll take that because we'll probably go back in and use it. And we'll just take out the text. In fact, we'll just do that. That's the other thing we want to do. Oh yes, unloaded. So what I want to do is, is on the loaded event, go over to the code. And what I'm going to do in here, is I'm going to say CPU name dot text equals system dot time dot interrupt services dot well, I never remember the next bit. Time information, that's the one. Dot processor architecture, dot two string. It will do automatically, but let's just do that. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm going to put on the screen the CPU that we're actually running as, so we can see um, what, uh, what architecture we've got on this device. Let's just build it locally uh, and make sure it works, and I haven't typed anything wrong. <clears throat> Marcus, just while you're... Um... Just getting that build. We've had a question on the uh, on Twitch, which is, uh, what, could you please clarify why a PWA would be faster on an ARM device? Um, oh, simply because the well, so so let's let's talk about the the architecture of Spotify specifically. So Spotify has, is um, actually an Electron app, or it, it's. Uh, uh, CEF, Chromium Embedded Frameworks. So it's running, uh, the whole browser it ships with the application. Um, so when you run the experience there, the browser itself is emulated. So when you, uh, when you then display the page uh, uh, within Spotify, that experience is running as an emulated experience uh, of HTML on an emulated x86. So when I go to the browser page itself, if that has been, if the environment, if the browser itself has been compiled and optimized for ARM64, displaying the same HTML page will be faster because you're not running, the JavaScript code counts for some things, but you're not running uh, uh, CPU uh, independent or CPU specific code rather inside of your HTML or your JavaScript. You're actually saying to the, to the browser that you're running on, Run it in your native uh, 
uh, environment. So if it's compiled for ARM64, you'll get ARM64 performance uh, with a PWA, so whether you've got JavaScript or not. That's that's where you'll get the advantage. If your browser is not optimized, so if your browser, like in um, um, Electron or CEF, or today Chrome, Chrome on, on uh, ARM64 doesn't have an ARM64 build, the experience will be significantly uh, worse in terms of performance. And so uh, that's why we've done a lot of work with, we're still working with Google, trying to get them to ship uh, an ARM64 version. There doesn't seem to be any major reason why they can't do that. Uh, the Electron stuff, if you're an Electron app, there is an ARM64 version of Electron already. We've done that work. It's back with uh, that team. And I think it's version six from memory, 6.1 maybe. Uh, you can get an ARM64 version of that experience. So it's about the environment that you're running the page on, not about the page itself. So PWA on a browser, which is native, will give you a better experience. Um, by all means, fire off any other questions you've got. I'm quite happy to take them. Uh, what we've got here then, uh, I'll carry on for now though. It's, yeah, that's working fine. How do I get that onto my ARM64 device? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, what I need to do is actually go to remote machine here. Now I showed you that you can run Visual Studio on that machine, on the ARM64 machine, but you don't really wanna do that. The performance is fairly slow on that machine. We don't have anything uh, which works well. But what you'll see though, when I come into remote connections, I've already got my machine, my X1 Pro X, that's come up automatically. And the reason it's come up, I'll, I'll select it first. Uh, and then we will switch over in just a second and I'll show you how that happened. Now, oh, this is interesting. I can't show you both machines. Uh, uh, uh. So what, I'm, what I've done here, uh, I've selected the machine that's running uh, ARM64. Uh, I've installed, I've not running any extra tools on that machine. What I have done though is I've gone into settings and enabled developer mode and one other setting and I'll show you that in just a second and then I can hit go on this machine and it will connect uh, to that to the remote device and it will make a connection for me and it will ask me for a pin. So it's challenging me for a pin. Now on the other machine you can't see, I'll show you in a second, um, I'm going to grab a pin from it. Uh, and then uh, just to make sure I got that right. Yeah, I did. Go. And that all that's done is is taking care of the authentication for me. It's taking care of the connection for me. And now it will deploy uh, between the two. So what's what's different here is when you enable developer mode on. Uh, any Windows device, um, I, I forget which version it was, it might have been uh, 1803, we actually ship in the developer packages the Visual Studio remote debugger. So it actually ships with that package. So while that's deploying, let's switch over to the 64, to the ARM64 machine. And see what it's showing. So I'm going to stop sharing here, flick over. Okay, so there you can see the pin that I just typed in. This is the page that uh, I went to, the developer page. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, update and security down here. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, that's something else I should pick out. Uh, 2004 is shipping for um, all Windows 10 machines except the Pro X. It's not ARM machines, it's the Pro X specifically. We found two bugs uh, which are blocking updates. It was a fairly low hit rate, but it was enough to cause us to block it. So today you can't put 2004 on a Pro X. The second of those bugs, the first one's fixed. The second one we're looking to get done uh, early August. So uh, sometime in August, I'm hoping that this will start working. Anyway, uh, coming to updates here for developers, Enable developer mode, which you'll be familiar, familiar with. The second thing is device discovery. Turn that on and then you'll get this option to pair. Um, and the pair challenge comes first of all from the dev machine. And then you click on the pair button to get your code, type it in and the two things will connect. Uh, and you may have seen that actually that run. So I'm now running remotely that same application, but wait, 
it's running as x86. Aha, that's because the CPU that we selected when we built it was uh, x86, not ARM64. So back we go. Let's go fix that uh, uh, on that machine. Stop sharing. Uh, and then, so in order to actually build natively, so that demonstrates the emulation is working fine. Uh, what I need to do next is come here, stop that. I'll swap that over to ARM64 as, a, as an available target. That changes the compiler path over, so we're using the right one. Let's switch it to release mode. Now, because the way Visual Studio works with the configurations, you've got to go and do this again. Um, uh, it, it's per configuration, but I, I just go and select this X1. It's paired already, so it won't need to do the pairing again, uh, but we'll need to do the build. Um, so while we're, well, actually, while we're doing that, let's go over and switch back to the ARM64 machine. Hopefully, we won't have to do this too many more times. Bang, there it is. And we can wait patiently as the bits fly across the ether between the two machines. Just keeping an eye on the build. So uh, ARM64 builds, by the way, UWP ARM64 builds are a little slower. Uh, and they're a little slower because we use the .NET native tool chain in order to support ARM64. It's a requirement. The um, uh, I'll talk a bit more about .NET Frameworks when we finish this piece, but the uh, the first supported .NET Framework for ARM64 was UWP because of the um, .NET native toolchain being able to make use of the C++ compiler in its final build step. Uh, um, and uh, that meant that they could shortcut a whole bunch of problems with uh, with building um, and actually running .NET code with other frameworks on the device. Uh, since then, we've, we've made some updates uh, to other frameworks, and I'll talk about those in a sec. Come on, machine. Still building. Oh, it's copying, actually. It's now registering. Three, two, one. Kabang. As if by magic. It's changed the architecture to 64 bit. Great, everybody clap, hooray. Uh, so what does that mean we can do as far as debugging? I mean, we ought to do just a little bit, didn't we? So let's, I'm gonna go back one more time. How are we doing on time? Uh, okay. We're doing okay on time. Right, come back to the debugger here. Let's just restart that. Uh, actually, yeah, what I was going to show you, it will try it, it shouldn't take too long, um, is that actually I've got full control over the debugger here. There's no there's no limitations, there's no degrading because it's ARM64, it's exactly the same. Um, it uh, The experience is just as rich as if you were doing Visual Studio for any other CPU. Uh, so, actually, I'm going to leave that running and flip back to the slides for a second. We'll come back to it. So, so what about compatibility? What about uh, compatibility with apps? Um, well, we've done we've done a lot. We're continuing to do research. We keep looking at this. It's one of those areas where we're investing pretty heavily. But when you look at the top fifty apps across all form factors and mobile devices, then we find it's less than half are actually emulated uh, on ARM sixty four. So there is an experience. It's not the most optimal experience, but there is an experience. Um, there are some which are optimized emulated. What do I mean by that? Well, you can, you can it, it might be that converting everything to ARM64 is just too expensive. It's too much work. But there might be things you could do uh, to improve the battery performance, the battery uh, consumption and increase the performance without porting the whole thing. Maybe there's one particular calculation function you port to ARM64 and it improves the performance of the whole app and the battery usage significantly. And there's a number of apps that have done that. Office is in that space and continuing to push more and more um, to ARM64 over time, but they currently have an optimized experience. And there's a good chunk that are actually native uh, already. It's a good chunk of apps that have already got ARM64 experiences, but there are still some 
that don't work. Um, and there's there's reasons for that. So so let's take a step back and, and state of the nation. Where are we with apps? So if you're looking at bringing any driver based software, so anything that actually has to integrate with the system, there's no emulation layer. It's got to be uh, CPU native for the particular device. So you have to port to make it work. So that's virus software, uh, remote access software, which might need to control um, the screen or the keyboard or whatever, and any hardware that needs a specific custom driver. Um, shell extensions is the other one, uh, the bytes. So if you're doing file uh, extensions or context menu extensions or input methods, then because of the way you're integrating with the system, there's no emulation in a, uh, integrating within an existing ARM64. So you have to be ARM64 ported. And those two are relatively small and, we, and we've hit all the, most of the big ones. There's still some to come. The one that, that we're uh, focusing on heavily right now is middleware. So it's no good asking ISVs and, and software developers to to build out ARM64 if the frameworks they rely on don't. Uh, and we've done a lot of good work in this space, but there's more to do. So uh, my team's partnering with ARM Holdings and with Qualcomm to get that uh, accelerated and they're doing work in this space. So UWP is already ported. We've got .NET native. .NET 5 is gonna bring ARM64 support to uh, command line and to WinForms. Uh, that's in pre-release. The release is later this year. WPF is coming. That's going to be uh, calendar year 21 when they ship that in the .NET 5 framework. And .NET Core already uh, supports uh, ARM64. Uh, .NET Core 3. Oh, it might even be 3.1, actually. Um, but the last one, which uh, usually comes up, is, and this is pretty small, dynamic code generation is uh, these days is, is not that common possibly some security software, but intrinsics are. Intrinsics can be, you know, where you're actually calling down into the um, uh, the CPU uh, specific instructions uh, to optimize, you know, hand optimize some very tight code. Then yes, you're gonna have to look at that because it is CPU specific, but the ARM chip has its own intrinsics in the same way as Intel does. Um, the other big one at the moment, there's no X64 em emulation. Uh, so that's not available. Why is that a point? Uh, well, if you can't build for x86, then you can't run on this device. And um, we have got some apps in the store which are x64 only. So, so, so those are sort of the fringes. But as I said before, the majority of the apps do run on the device, either native um, or emulated. So, so why do you care? Um, well, you get stuff back by porting. But the question is always how much? Now, how much is it worth spending this time? And, and the answer to that is, unfortunately, it's, it's pretty complicated to actually figure out how much you get back by converting your app. Uh, and the reason it's complicated is because there are different gains based upon different profiles of app. So if your app is CPU intensive, then you're gonna get huge benefits. Uh, port, it's great, the water's warm, come on in. If your app is GPU intensive, it's gonna be less because the GPU instructions are native regardless. Um, so you're not gonna gain, if you're spending 80% of your time in the GPU, you're not gonna get a whole lot. You'll get something, but you're not gonna get a whole lot by, uh, by porting it. So it's worth thinking about what the split is. And, and there's other things as well. So I'm gonna flip back and show you one last short demo. Uh, yes. Um, we've just got a question on chat about X64. Um, yep. Just got somebody saying, why why isn't it supported or why, why won't it be supported? It's not currently available. Support for that is not currently available because it is a hard problem. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly massive piece of engineering. It was fairly massive to do X86. It's, uh, I wouldn't say it's a, uh, 32 bits harder, um, but it, but it is a lot harder to do it. Um, that doesn't mean to say we're done, uh, but we we don't have it today. Um, so yeah, uh, nothing today. 
Uh, okay, so I just want to show you this one. So here we have our breakpoint. Uh, if you can remember what I can do here, if I go into, you're all gonna love this. If we go into debug windows, because everybody does this all the time, right? Uh, go into my disassembly, where is it? There, Ta -da. there, look, it's ARM instructions, right? I can even see the instructions. I can go look at the registers. Um, of course, everybody knows what the ARM instructions are, right? No? Oh, okay. Maybe you'll like me then. Uh, right, so let's uh, let's stop playing around with that. And let's jump over to the ARM64 machine again. Just gonna kill that. Right, so what is the performance benefit? Well, it just so happens I made a couple of apps here. Uh, let me run the other one. That one. So you might spot they're actually the same app. One is compiled. Um, I've got to try to remember which one it is. Oh yes, the right. So the left-hand one, this guy here, is compiled for ARM64 native. The right-hand one is compiled for x86, so it's emulated. Um, and they're both built release. Uh, so they've been through the optimizer. There's no debug information in there. Uh, so they're running as fast as they can. I, the code behind this, uh, I'm quite happy to show you, we're probably a bit out of time, but um, the code behind it in the CPU test here, it's pretty horrible code. But all I do is literally go through and manipulate a list. Uh, and I do it a lot of times, but this is taking 7,586 ticks uh, to do that. But it's just literally just crunching the CPU, banging through, doing instructions in the CPU. I had to do some clever stuff in there to stop the optimizer from ripping it all out because it all looked at it and went, yeah, there's nothing going on here and threw it all away. And so it was really, really fast. But what I've got, I'm doing some hashing in there as well. So it, it, it just um, chunk, uh, chunks through some numbers. This second test here is actually uh, running framework API calls. So it, it's not just framework, but I'm doing, I'm actually calling um, it C++ in, in this particular case, I'm calling multi-byte to wide conversion and I'm calling wide to multi-byte and I'm doing that a uh, hundred times. Uh, and there's, uh, I'll explain why uh, why that's important. So that's nine, that's 10 seconds roughly. And the last one I've got here is floating point. So I'm doing a whole lot of double calculation inside this, uh, this loop and actually again, doing the same thing. I'm having to pull out numbers as we go through. So that's about four seconds. Exactly the same code pushed through the ARM CP ARM compiler. Uh, when I run the CPU test, as I said, if you're running ARM, uh, if you're running uh, CPU instructions, it's going to be a lot faster. So you can see here, 7,500 to 2,100, same code, significantly faster, and that equates to less battery as well. It's you know it's more efficient. Uh, we should have run this one, it takes takes a while. But when we're using the framework, remember what we saw about the CPHE, the, the hybrid, the, the chippy hybrid apps, where they're actually running, um, a lot of the code is running in ARM64 already. Because I'm doing a lot of framework, and I'm doing majority of the stuff is running in that framework, the, the, the improvement is, is a lot lower. There's a, still a bit of improvement because you've got to do a jump backwards, backwards and forwards between x86 and ARM64, uh, but you can see it's nothing like you know the the two thirds quicker uh, than this. It's like one second or one thousand ticks, I should say. And the, oh, I didn't run this one. The floating point test. Uh, well, okay, I, I picked this one out because it is quicker, but an ARM chip isn't great at doing floating point anyway. It's better than it used to be but you're still not exercising the strength of the chip. And I guess I should probably put some GPU tests in there just to show you that and some file tests, but their framework as well. So what is it telling us? Well, it's saying actually exactly what, what I put on the last slide. You're gonna get the most benefit from your CPU uh, changes. So if you're CPU intensive applications, you're gonna get a, a marked improvement, but no app is just CPU. Uh, intensive. If it is, it's probably a mistake, right? Uh, sitting there doing a tight loop. You can do a tight loop a lot quicker. Um, it's a mixture of user interaction. It's a mixture of uh, file operations and floating point and framework APIs. And so actually saying how much benefit you'll get is pretty hard, but it's clear you'll get some benefit. You'll get benefit in battery and you'll get benefit in performance if you invest um, in 
that port. Okay, that's probably enough. Let us. Mark, if somebody's asking about power consumption. Um, and would it be possible to evaluate power consumption? I guess the lower ticks is just um, more efficient, less power. Is that the way of looking at it? It's not. Yes, it's not. It's not a not an exact measurement. We do have power test rigs that we use for our kit. Um, but the, if you're using the Visual Studio Power tool inside of the uh, the debug uh, page that effectively ties the CPU to the power. Some instructions are slightly more intensive because they're using multi-cycle, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's, a good, it's a good approximation. So if your CPU is pinned at 100% for five minutes, that is twice as efficient and twice, uh, half the power you can imagine than your CPU being pinned to 100% for 10 minutes. Um, so that's a guide. So in terms of the numbers there, the time execution, uh, I didn't actually show you the CPU level, but imagine it was probably 80 or 90% in all of those uh, tests. It would have been pretty close. Um, then, yeah, that equates to a, a pretty much one-to-one -to, -one to, uh, to the power consumption. Okay, let me finish off. So why care about ARM64? I'm sure in your mind you're thinking, yeah, it's not quite that straightforward. But here's the big thing. The vision we've got for ARM64 is about um, delivering a great experience to, to our customers of Windows and driving the ecosystem forward. And we can have those plans, but without the ISVs, without the uh, software delivering the same thing, the overall experience for the users will be degraded. So if we want to target battery that's more than one day, it needs everybody that every app that the user is using needs to give back its own piece into that mix. And so it's important that we drive that forward. Um, and and I, maybe this is a little flippant, but it is saving the planet one cut line of code at a time. So we, we were thinking about a measurement for our team this year. If we can figure out how many, how many, um, how much battery we can save on one app. So you can extrapolate that, you know, if, if the app is, Let's say we can work it out 5% more efficient on a particular execution path. And we can work out that that execution path on that app runs uh, 400 times a week for each user. And that, I'm making it up, but, and that user, uh, and, and that user uses it for, I don't know, uh, 40 weeks of the year. And there are 20,000 users across the world. I can work that out in megawatts. And that's, that's actually quite significant. So if we can, you know, if we, we pull together and get this stuff uh, working, we are saving the planet one line of code at a time. But most of all, it's about the best user experience possible. If these devices are capable of being great and changing the landscape, then by doing this investment, uh, we maximize the chance of, of seeing a better place, a better experience for the users uh, going forward. And, and lastly, there is a wave here. I mean, it's not just Microsoft now, Apple are in on this as well. Um, and that means investment and that means um, momentum and uh, movement forward and opportunities. And it's a wave and it's gonna be a wave of investment from everybody driving into uh, a diverse chipset that's lower power. Uh, and it's a great time to ride that wave. So these are where we're investing. Microsoft is, is continuing to invest in the longer term future in silicon. We're working with ARM, we're working with Qualcomm and other manufacturers to get the best experience out of that silicon, to get the, num the most number of components in the system on chip. Uh, AI, I've, I've really not touched on that, but uh, bringing AI into these uh, system on chips is a, is a real possibility. And that is a game changer. So uh, we're investing in that space to see what experiences we can bring. Connectivity is there today. How does that disrupt the, um, the smartphone market and what opportunities are there for people, uh, for ISVs to, to deliver applications that are unique because of the connectivity? Um, but of course, we're investing in quality as well. We, we need the, Microsoft needs the experience of uh, Winners and ARM to be the best it can be. Uh, so just to wrap up here, a couple of points. Uh, I sort of touched on what we what you can use. Visual Studio 2017 does still work or will work against ARM64, but 2019 uh, is um, has a slightly better experience and more tools in it. 
you can build UWP, you can build desktop bridge, uh, you can build Win32, C++ apps, uh, and you can build uh, with .NET 5, you can build um, .NET apps for WinForms for ARM64. Today, WPF is coming. Uh, if you're looking at PWA, uh, Edge Anaheim from the beginning of this year does support ARM64, as I showed you. And there are some links. I'll share the slides through Pete and the team uh, so you can um, uh, you can uh, take a look at the links there. I said we're partnering with ARM directly. Uh, they've actually got a landing site, uh, which is improving and we'll, we'll continue to invest in more useful um, and relevant information there. And the last thing to point out on this slide is that we are considering whether we can provide access to hosted ARM64 environments. They're not available today. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion with the Azure folks about that, but that should bring accessibility. Uh, so today you actually have to go buy a device. Um, they're not that expensive, but they are money. Um, but hopefully we'll have something to talk about uh, later in the year. Uh, and if you get stuck, I am invested in seeing you succeed on ARM64. So uh, by all means, drop me an email, uh, remind me where we met uh, virtually and uh, give me a question. I'll do my best. If not me, then Alex is one of my counterparts or Gary, who's what I'm working with. And um, we'll see if we can get, uh, get answers to. And that's it. <laughs>